Jimmy Anderson, HR Studio, HR Podcast, first first appearance, welcome. Um, following in the footsteps of your former colleague, Chris Vosper. Chris Vosper, indeed, yeah. And that's how I, uh, yeah, he was the one that introduced me. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Um, did you, fl- did you, f- you flew with Chris, did you say? Did you fly in the same airframe? Yes, I did. Uh, did we ever, we started on Gazelle. So on tiny little helicopters, years before, um, I was I was a flight commander, and Chris came up as a baby pilot to come and hold with us. So we went flying together then. I don't think we ever flew Apache together. We weren't in the same unit. Sorry, these are good, aren't they? They're really good. Jesus, yeah. I'm nibbling away at this guy. <laughs> Big show. Yes. Wait, just to break the, the rhythm of the podcast there, I brought in Crimble's Big Jam Coconut Rings, bought them from the local garage, and these are incredible. I wasn't expecting that taste sensation. Mm. I'm not sure we need six of them. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. Right, so. What's the... What, uh, flight Commander, forget yep. my ignorance. Yep. What is the... What rank... What is that... Equi- is that a rank or a, an appointment? So that's an appointment. Oh, okay. So I was, okay. that was when we were both in the army, in the Air Corps. So captain in charge of, what do you have, probably four gazelles and about eight people um, back in the old days when it was, you know, um, based on the, based in Germany on the Russian hordes coming over and we used to do the hell arm stuff with the Lynx and we'd be the little recce gazelles. So we would train and practice uh, doing reconnaissance in our gazelles and then you'd call in the strike which was the lynx at the time when did you get in uh i started in 98 mate you do not look your age oh why are you younger than me (laughs) (laughs) moisturize no i don't (laughs) Uh, so you spent most of your career training right yes is that right to say training training pilots yes or training potential pilots uh both so I did, <coughs> I've done, yeah, a mixture of both. So training uh, students to become pilots. And then I spent a lot of time training pilots in frontline skills. So training on operations, training for operations, uh, all the stuff I'm sure you did on the ground. You know, we did the same in the air and you would have had guys teaching you on the ground before you go. And we did the same. So um, generic skills training as well as then, you know, work up training before we went to Afghanistan um, twice. So, did you in your in your training? Oh, in fact, how do you get to become an instructor then? Is it uh, how yeah? How does that work? I know I understand the, how the army infantry works in terms yeah. of you do the job, then you maybe go off and be an instructor, a depot, for example, or yeah. a tra- or a, some training school, for example, IBS or a. Mm-hmm. What it, snipers or whatever it may be. What how does yep. it work within? So the Army within Air Corps? the within the Air Corps, very similar to be honest. So you start as a you start as a baby pilot, kind of learn your trade. He's going in. Uh, start as a baby pilot, learn your trade, and then you with you have to get a minimum amount of hours and experience um, that's laid down, and then probably sim- similar to yourselves in the infantry, I guess you you then ask for it. And you say, you know, I want to become an instructor and I want to go to the school and I want to teach. And you normally start at the basic level. So you'd normally start at our basic school. Uh, You do a course, they teach you how to teach, and then you kind of cut your teeth teaching at the school. So teaching the the junior students. And then you progress from there and they sort of send you out to the front line and then you get and you do the more involved teaching. That may be the same as infantry if you're an officer. If you're, <laughs> but if you're not an officer, you don't go. Don't get a oh, I'd like to go here, please. Oh, do <laughs> you? Do you? You'd like to go there, would you? I don't think so. No. With um, yeah, on the officer side of it, you get more Got it, opportunity. Yeah. But like would that, you not? Though. Would you guys who want to become instructors, teaching skills, not request? You know, be like, you know, you do your, you have your chat with your boss and be a. Oh, I'd like to go to, you know. Um, oh yeah, you can, it's aspirations, isn't it? It's yeah. aspirations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it'd be similar. You know, you go to the boss. You say, "This is what I want to do." You wouldn't necessarily get it. Um, mm. you, and you know, as you would know, it's that whole: can they spare you at the unit? Can they let you go away and do the course? Um, can they let you go away and then teach at our basic school? 
or do they need you on the front line um, as a front line rotary driver? And often, you know, a lot of guys wanted to go and they wouldn't be, uh, couldn't get away because uh, didn't have enough people to, you know, deploy. So it was um, a done deal. Sorry. No. <coughs> Were you training for any time? Would you train both heli pilots and fixed wing pilots? No, or I just, only well, helicopters. Okay. So helicopters all the way, yeah. So, but this crossover between the two in terms of your basic, I mean, I was going to say field craft then, like <laughs> aviation map reading, for example. Yeah, definitely. And we'd all start on fixed wing. So they, they start you off on a, a little plane, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, because it's you know cheaper to run and in theory slightly easier and like you said your sort of basic aviation field craft they would teach you on a little plane see how you get on if you can pass that and cut the uh, sort of cut the mustard on that then you progress on um, and at the time it was all it's all tri-service uh, just when I started and then we'd progress on it was going rotary in the army because there wasn't really a fixed wing route at the time. And then the air force would get streamed to whether they're doing jets or transport or go rotary. Um, and the Navy were rotary, but depending on whereabouts they went in their rotary career, if you like. What part of, what kind of tasks were your, were your favorite tasks to do when you're on the helis? You mentioned the gazelles there, the recce, recce aspect. Yeah. I was, uh, I've been lucky enough, bit of a, jack of all trades master and none um and i've done a lot of different types which is quite unusual in the military so i did 11 years in the army and then 11 years in the air force and um everything everything's got its own sort of benefits if you like or its <coughs> own plus points so i've thoroughly enjoyed all the platforms i've been on but they're all very different what, what so go on what platforms have you flown then so, well, like I was saying, uh, Frontline started on Gazelle, Northern Ireland. So that was mainly reconnaissance, obviously. Um, and just, yeah, kind of learning your trade as a helicopter pilot, it was excellent. And obviously, I was young and keen, and uh, it was the, the front line at the time was Northern Ireland. Why uh, was a Gazelle preferred for recce? So it's, it was, it's small. It's lightweight, uh, good endurance, and at the time it was probably, I guess, probably cheap to run and very reliable. So all they needed in Northern Ireland at the time really was a, a mount for a camera. So similar to what the police rotary do back here. Um, so you had a, a camera on one side and then you had a, a night sun, massive torch on the other side for when it was all kicking off. And if the guys on the ground needed the, the street lighting up, uh, we could do that. So that was kind of the, that was what it was for. Uh, and then on the mainland, when it was more the um, <clears throat> going for conventional warfare, because it's small, the idea was that you could sneak around the battlefield um, and find targets and, that, and direct artillery and that sort of thing. And that was our kind of bread and butter back on the mainland. Go on. So what else did you fly? So from there, uh, Frontline then went on to Apache. So that was a bit of a step up. What's the difference in in terms of size and weight of the Apache compared to the Gazelle? Because the Apache is relatively small, right, when you think about it in the grand scheme of military, British military helicopters, yeah? The, the, the Apache's surprising. I think you'd be surprised. It's the same length as a Chinook. Okay, I am surprised, yeah. Yeah. So I never noticed that. Yeah. They're pretty big aircraft, considering there's only two of you on board. And why 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 is that? Why do they need to be that size? To carry the munitions. To carry the munitions. Exactly. That that's all it was designed for, as you know. Um, it's just munitions carriage. So it would be you would have a similar um all up mass to something like a um, a Merlin, and you're about Jesus. you're about the same length. An empty Merlin. Uh, nope, that was about all up. I think you could go to twenty two thousand pounds. So a Merlin, but fully laden with troops. Would, Apache would be a similar weight. Yes, with, with fully laden with ammo. 
fully laden. Yeah. Jesus, I didn't yeah. realize that. So, yeah. So it's you know, big aircraft and a lot of kit on board. And like I said, you're about the same length as a Chinook. So surprising. <clears throat> Was the increase in the technology in the, in, in an airframe like uh, the increase of the amount of technology in an airframe like the Apache more of a hindrance or, a, or an advantage? Just in general, just generally, when you compare it to something like Gazelle, which I'm assuming didn't have as much buttons and knobs and displays and flipping all of the craziness that yeah. the Apache has, right? There might have been a couple of knobs in there, but it was <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, no, exactly that. The you know the Gazelle was very simple, and that's what made it really reliable and great fun to fly. The Apache, obviously, the sort of forefront of technology. You know, they've got the new ones coming in now. <clears throat> and the the technology was amazing you know it was it was an excellent platform and excellent at what it did uh, so and the technology enabled us to do things uh, for example we worked alongside the americans a lot in afghanistan uh, and they'd fly the cobra which is reasonably old as i'm sure you know and we it surprised me how much we could outperform them with our sensors and our technology and the stuff that they they couldn't do why is that um just because there's their aircraft so we're working with marines and a lot of their aircraft were quite old so you know when you say about comparing technology so our for example we could stand off um sort of comfortably five or six k's and we could still <coughs> see a target they had to be in much closer so obviously uh, noise footprint it's more dangerous because you're closer to the target i suppose for you but uh mainly if you're trying to trying to stay out of sight um, that was you know, one example uh, we had a radar as well which they didn't uh, we could use that for picking up targets um, and then our actual targeting systems were more advanced so you're more likely to get a first round on target I believe um, not knowing their systems inside out but just from what I saw and the Apache was the <clears throat> was the uh, the controls for the Apache, the flying the Apache, yeah. as in we're talking manoeuvring the Apache. Yeah, were they were they digitally connected or were they was it were they manually connected? So you had both. So it was uh, manual control runs with a digital backup, which was pretty cool. So if you, I would have thought would, I would have thought it'd be the other way around. Uh, so what you had was you've got uh, digital. You, sorry, you've got manual control runs connected, and you've got a digital backup, which is. Uh, putting, sending a, a digital signal when you move the controls up to the uh, the hydraulics effectively that are moving the, the blades to make it do what it does. Um, and the electrical signal, we were told, would get there quicker than you moving the control run, but it was the perfect system as a backup. So if you're... How does that... Hang on a minute. I can't get my head around that. So I... Um, so you, you've got a you've got the cyclic so the stick yeah so i make a movement and the time it takes i make a movement the stick senses i've made a movement there's a manual control run so like a, a bar if you fe if, if you like a control rod running up to the top to the head as i move <coughs> that the time it takes for that to move and with all the links in it etc it's quicker, the system can pick up the movement on the stick and send an electrical signal faster than the physical movement of that rod, is what we were told. I Yeah, that's that not making sense, sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> I think when you move the... Because in my head, unless yeah. there's some something in that system, the mechanical system, that's going to cause a delay, like... So you think I don't you know, got, is a spring or something? Yeah, so there is would it, be. There'd be springs and linkages and oh. stuff, so... Yeah, you're only talking milliseconds. Milliseconds, yeah. But, um, but in theory, the electrical signal would get there quicker. Got it. Now I understand. And yeah. that provided you the perfect backup. So if you took, uh, you know, if you took damage, and the physical control runs were damaged, <coughs> then you would still have the backup of the digital signal. Did you fly the Merlin when we mentioned it? Uh, mention no, it? I've I've been in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've, I've flown in it with the guys. I seem to remember when it came in. It got a bad rap when it came in, but I think it was because of the way it was kitted out. Yeah, they had... Uh, remember a dub, debac debac debacle? Debacle. <laughs> remember a debacle? <laughs> remember a debacle when they first came in and we went... We, you couldn't sit in the seats with your bell kit on. 
the and it was the old uh, barrack room gen was that the, each seat cost something like sixty thousand pounds, and when you sat in them, yeah, with your belt kit on, it was so narrow you couldn't yeah. sit with your belt kit on. The other one was they had the five point harness, yep, which which is a pain in the ass to say, say not good when you're trying to. Oh my god, get on and off. Yeah, quickly. I remember that being a thing. And they had to they had to re they had to redesign all the seating. Not yeah, maybe bullshit though. Mm. No, that was that was true because they designed all the seats in the back to be crash worthy seats, so they're like properly designed seats. So unlike a Chinook where you would just have basically webbing seats, you know, designed probably in the seventies, I'm guessing, seventies, eighties, um, they were proper properly crash worthy seats and that's but why not, it would be not so not frontline soldier worthy. Not designed with the frontline <laughs> soldier. And they had things like the ramp was too steep so you can Oh, really? Get up the ramp. Well, the guys were saying, you know, if they're fully fully kitted out, it was mega steep to try and get into the back of the aircraft. So, yeah, they did have some issues with it. Mm, classic. <laughs> what else do you fly? So, do the Apache, the, uh, the Gazelle? Yes. Uh, I taught on Squirrel for a bit. So, that's just a... Tra- squirrel? Squirrel. Never heard of it. Training aircraft. So, uh, I don't know. You, you may have seen them. A uh, little yellow and black thing. That's what they painted them up at Shawbury. It was our basic training helicopter. So I taught on that for a bit. Uh, I then went across to the Air Force and I flew the Puma. So Puma 1 and then we converted to Puma 2. What's the difference? So the it was a midlife upgrade for the aircraft. So they stripped it right back. Uh, It had new engines. It had a digital cockpit, uh, fiber optic, comms suite, um, trying to think what else did we have um it was kind of all the electronics and everything on board were upgraded but the shell and the things like the gearbox remained the same Uh, so it was only an upgrade and it still looked identical which i think was bad because um a lot of people weren't too keen on the puma after various incidents Mm. and i think the fact that we brought this new aircraft in it looked exactly the same as the old one um, probably didn't help, <laughs> but it was it was an excellent beast. It's like uh, the, still uh, is, it's like the SA eighty Mark One and, and the HK. Okay. Yeah, HK exactly. A one or whatever. <laughs> yeah, e- exactly. Same shit, same. different cock handle. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good yeah. way to describe it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which where did you where did you serve tours wise? You did Northern Ireland. Are you based in Germany as well? Uh, you did no. Afghan as well? So, oh, you, you yeah, didn't did, do Northern Ireland. I did Northern Ireland, didn't do Germany. Oh, okay. Right. So um, I did, yeah, did Northern Ireland as my first tour. Did Wadisham, Gazelle. I did Wadisham um, on Apache, uh, where I did Afghanistan, Kabul, uh, sorry, not Kabul, going mad, down at Bastion. And then uh, when I was Air Force, I was over in Benson, uh, base, so Oxfordshire, Reddingway, oh, yeah. um, on the Puma, and deployed out to Kabul. It's the first Puma deployment out to Kabul, um, which was cool. And also managed, did three years in Canada, teaching the Canadians uh, on exchange, which was Teaching cool. them flying. Flying, yeah. So they were short of military instructors. What was that like? How different were they? Uh, they're very British. So Canadians? Yeah, weirdly. Even the French ones? E- uh, okay. The French ones, not so much. But the, uh, yeah, they... Good sense of humour. They like boozing. It was like being at home. Uh, it was excellent. Really? Absolutely. They always seem a bit straight to me. No. Uh, certainly not the, the military guys. Oh, the military were, right, were, yeah. were, uh, were excellent. Yeah. I but I mean, what, in terms of... Um, in terms of the way they operated, in terms of their TTPs... I was, was only like? at their basic school, so I never saw Frontline. So it was their basic helicopter and fixed wing training school. So we were teaching their instructors how to how to teach basic students, if you like. So we, I never saw any of the didn't re, uh, I didn't really have much to do with the frontline Canadian military, if that makes sense. Is it? Uh, do you th- do you think it's a lot different teaching teaching pilots to be pilots than it is other stuff, or is it the same kind of principles? How did you find it? Uh, yeah, teaching pilots to be pilots is pretty much the same and I think they use very similar techniques and methodology as we do Um, I think there's a lot of sharing of information between the two countries 
so they look at often look at how we do stuff and you know take probably pick the good bits out so yeah very what, similar what platforms are they rocking or were they rocking at the time? so we were teaching well we were teaching on jet ranger so old school Jet uh, Ranger. Jet Ranger. Squirrel and Jet Ranger. Oh, yeah, I'm going to use the laptop these up. pulleys out. <laughs> you keep talking. You go on. Okay. So, Squirrel uh, and Jet Ranger. Yeah. And then uh, they had a little Bell, a, a little, uh, Bell 412, so Huey-based thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had the same aircraft over The ones here. in all the movies. Yes, that's it. But with four blades, not two. And so they had those on their front line as well. Uh, they also had Chinook. So, similar Two blades. Are they the old ones had two blades. The old they? ones had two blades, yeah. You, you're sort of Vietnam. That's era. crazy. Yeah. Can I, here's a question for you. Yeah. On things like the Merlin, yes. on things like the Apache, yeah. things like the Gazelle, but the, yeah. well, the Merlin more specifically and the Apache, which have, what's the Apache got? Six blades? Uh, no, that's four blades. Merlin's got six, right? Uh, five. God's sake. Are there any helicopters that can lose a blade? No. Let's keep flying. No. Just one. That would be really. Just want, like they're like like they're flying <laughs> no, with a limp. A bit of a, a bit of limpy <laughs> flying. No, unfortunately not. Uh, we had a gazelle where the blade came off. And oh really? It, uh, yeah. It doesn't end well. The aircraft basically destroys itself in the air. So they are, they are also though some of them are surprisingly robust. Now, it must have been a puma. Was sea sea kings weren't in Afghan, were they? Yes, they were. Oh, yeah. fuck's sake, that confuses things. The Navy Sea Kings with the radars on board were there used for um, looking for vehicles. Oh, they weren't troop carrying, though. No. Right, it's a Puma. No, so, sorry. I got taken into a into an op. M- my team, when we, got the, we were on Pumas then. The Puma can only what? How many can Puma carry in the back? You, where were you based? Uh, this was, we were based out of Kandahar, but we weren't, we, no. we weren't in Helmand or anywhere like that. Wouldn't have been Puma at the time. Was it, hang on, was it that tall? So Puma didn't. Puma only did yeah, that yes, Kabul, one, yeah. and that was in two thousand. Okay, it must have been Sea King then. I only can Sea King kind of in the back. Yeah, they did have Sea King there to start with. That's two or three in the back. Not a lot. Um, they, I mean, the Sea King can. I think they can take up to about twenty people in the back. No, but I don't know what they were doing at the no, time. No, we were small, it was really smaller. Hot. Must have been Puma. It was smaller. I mean, can Puma kind of in the back? Uh, you could take comfortably take ten with full kit. Yeah, it was a Puma. Had to be. No, I didn't it wasn't a Sea King. It wasn't a Merlin, because the Merlin could only wasn't, carry definitely about wasn't six Merlin. people. Definitely wasn't a Merlin. No. no. Well, hang on a minute. I say it definitely was wasn't a Merlin. <laughs> no, I'm sure it wasn't a Merlin. It was either, I always, Puma and Sea King have always confused, for some stupid reason, they don't <laughs> even look the same. They've always confused me. But, long story short, yeah. I was in a fucking helicopter. You were in a helicopter. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of space. Yeah. And the team was split between uh, two... Two helis. We came in to be dropped off on this ridge. And it, I say ridge. It was like, I mean, this. it, it was no bigger than, than a, 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 pave, a paving slab. Yeah. Like what we were stepping off onto, it was proper narrow. And the, the, um, my heli came in first, dropped me in the first half. I, mean, I say team, there was five of us. Yeah. Dropped me and the other, the other two guys with me off onto there. We stepped down, just got off that, that paving slab size top, literally hunched down at the way because the next heli was coming in. Yeah. The next heli came in. I don't know what the load he did. I don't know what he was thinking. Got it completely fucking wrong. Got too far forward and the tail rotor came in and, and smashed off the top of the rock. And oh. honestly, we like jumped, dived out the way down yeah. to the next couple of ledges. Yeah. All three of us, shit flying everywhere. Got up. It had carved out of the rock. Uh, like the rotor carved at the rock. The, the heli obviously peeled off. Yeah. Like <laughs> in, wow. in clip. Didn't, sp- didn't didn't like spiral out of control. Yeah. Did a controlled landing down on the valley floor, which wasn't which wasn't great. Yeah. Control land down on the valley floor and everyone got off. We landed obviously because he damaged the tail rotor but managed to land. Yeah. But you would have thought that would have smashed that tail rotor to pieces. I mean Sparks, was shit was flying everywhere. My life flat before my eyes. Because it was literally, it was, you know, it was a couple of feet away. Yeah. If, it, if that rock hadn't been there, it would have been taking my head off. Yeah. You know. And that thing's moving pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. And it was a Puma Sea King Merlin thing. hybrid. It was, it was a, a, it was a heli. Thing. It was a helicopter was, thing. What's that yeah. up there? It's a helicopter. Yeah. yeah. That's that story. So they are pretty yeah. robust as well, aren't they? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, they must be. Pretty, I've just proven pretty it. Pretty robust. <laughs> it's your, after your story, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I need to find out what heli that was. God's sake. 
pain in the ass. That was a pain in the ass because they had to sit in that valley floor for ages. We had a we had a big we had a company up going in. Yeah. So they couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. While we were they just had to the guys basically who were in the heli ended up just on guarding the valley the, floor guarding the helicopter with yeah. the pilots because the pilots couldn't fly near either and the loading. Yeah. Yeah. That's never good as a pilot. No, that's not that's good. Not, that's that's not where you want to be. Get a taste of the infantry world. Yeah. Get in there. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Um yeah. You have any uh, close calls when you're flying? No. No, touch wood. I've been... Uh, it's been pretty safe, to be honest. Oh, I know. You said you got, you got brassed we did up. Got, we did get shot at. By the flying yeah, pineapples. By the, by the, yeah. Um, yeah, but that was nothing too bad. Uh, certainly in the Apache. <laughs> relatively speaking. Relatively speaking. <laughs> well, and to be honest, when you're... You know, you're in a... At a an armoured Apache at 3,000 feet and you're top covering the guys on the ground and it's 40 odd degrees and they've got God knows how much kit on. Um, yeah, I think our lot was pretty good, to be honest. I, uh, yeah, I could never complain. And, you know, we were, we were pretty well protected where we were. So. Yeah, yeah but you, it was quite, uh, the hours were long, weren't they? Long, stressful hours, stressful times. I remember Chris yeah. talking about it and I think, have I had other pilots on? I think Chris was the first one I had on, but yeah, I know he's the second one I had on. But yeah, I mean, you do need to suffer disservice there. Like, it was yeah, it was long, long time, but uh, it would. I was going to say. Oh, there's a squirrel. Right, I've just googled the squirrel. You it is, googled yeah. it. Got it there. That's the squirrel. That, That's it. Yeah, and then yeah. what was that other one you mentioned about? Um, the jet ranger. Oh, uh, so that squirrel just looks like one of those. Ellie's that goes up and flies for the news and stuff. Yes. Yeah, it's just a training helicopter. Okay. And the other one was what? Uh, Jet Ranger, Bell 206. Jet Ranger, Bell 206. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that doesn't look safe for the two... The two uh, <laughs> the makes two. a cool sound, though. Do, what, does it make, it makes a that, different like, sound, walk, does walk, it? Walk, you know, that Vietnam Huey sound. Oh, does it? Is yeah. that where it comes from? Two blades? Two blades. Yeah. That's what gives you that that sound. So, so pilots uh, like the sound of the helis, like petrol heads, like the sound of like a f- straight yeah. six compared to a... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it might be a terrible helicopter, but it sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flipping heck. Um, what were we talking about then? Oh, you'd be yeah, modest just, about not only uh, dramas. Yeah. What we were doing. Yeah. 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 Did you... Um, would you have preferred to have carried on your time when you were in? Uh, no. As in, as in, I'm like, I'm glad I left, kind of thing. Or yeah, do you mean? Yeah, I, uh, I think I'd done enough. If that makes sense, I, um, I had sort of goals in my mind that I wanted to achieve, <clears throat> and I'd achieved all of them. And I, re- I felt that I was just getting to the point I would just be doing the same thing again that I've already done. And it, yeah, to me that seemed a little pointless. Um, I like new opportunities. I like new challenges, and I I think I've got quite a low boredom threshold. I like to be doing things. And when I got back from Canada, I was really excited to be joining the Puma Force again. And when I got there, having been away for three, just over three years, it really felt like they'd taken a step backwards from when I'd been there before. Oh, in what way? Um, just the aircraft, they were struggling at the time with serviceability, so the aircraft weren't particularly serviceable. They Why was, for what reason? Um... It was a spares issue, so they were struggling to get spare parts for the aircraft, basically, and the aircraft was still out in Kabul in Afghanistan, so that was taking a lot of the spare parts away from mainland training, because obviously that's the priority, and the training out, the training for Kabul was exactly what we had been doing, and so they were still doing the same thing again. Uh, the AO was getting smaller, the HLSs were getting reduced, so the actual job out on ops was getting less if you like um and as we as we've seen you know that was all just prior to the drawdown so the thought of just training for that and just going to do the same thing again really didn't appeal Mm. so yeah it's been uh made the right choice or i feel i have at the moment when you were sorry i just thought about i didn't think to ask chris actually i don't know why when you were um Oh, Andy, Andy Furness is the other guy I had on. He was a, um, uh, I was going to say a lodi, but that's quite a general term, isn't it? But anyway, um, 
when you were training potential pilots or pilots, which was continuation training, yep. are there any, and again, across the spectrum, just you, of, of instructors, flight instructors, are there any um, like real life examples of flying like heroic or good practice or bad practice or like catastrophes and stuff that you would, that would be brought in to demonstrate a TTP that you're trying to teach or something like that? Um, so what using sort of real life examples of things that have happened for training? Yeah. I mean, we'd, we would train a lot for emergency handling of the aircraft, obviously, as I guess you would like to hope that you, you know, whoever's flying has practiced that a lot. And so a lot of that was based on people's experience, you know, or experiences <coughs> you've heard of, of this has happened leading to this and then what are we going to do about it how are we going to fix it like your example you know you hit your tail rotor on a mountain uh, which happened with one of the squirrels when they were mountain flying oh, right. and they were again really lucky they got away with it and they managed to get the aircraft on the ground so using things like that um, as a bit of a vehicle to then introduce an emergency scenario for your student to practice and i always preferred it if you had realistic scenarios for them um, rather than you just inventing something a bit random because um, hopefully then they can relate to that emergency and why they're doing it and why you're grilling them on knowing their drills and their skills etc does that make sense yeah yeah, that, that makes sense uh, um do you remember the kajaki incident which the minefield mm, yes yeah what's the take on that from a pilot's perspective or generally is there a is it a talked about was it a talked about thing or not because from out from our perspective there was always a there was always and still has still is yeah. a a question around um well one is like the platform available availability at the time and w what we were able to do and what we weren't able to do with with the airframes at the time um but I've only ever looked at it from a from a ground perspective. I'm just wondering if it's. I was going to say it's not something I've been involved in discussion wise. It was a mindful extraction. So, basically. Yeah, I was going to say I'd, I know this. I know the story or the incident, what happened, but I don't know um, from an aviation point of view, kind of the ins and outs, if that makes yeah. sense. I think it was more to do with availability and resource. You know, of resource being able to get the guys out. Yeah, yeah. and it was also a. There was also a, an outcry from you know, a number of people and quarters about the fact that at the time the Chinooks didn't have a, the, chin, the available Chinooks didn't have a winch capability. Yeah. And so when they came in, they couldn't sense. pick them up. And in the end, it was, I think it was Pedro that came in or something like that. Came in, but they just fucking landed. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. No, no, no. I was just asking. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, what sticks in your mind as the um, as as the mem memorable moments from you flying? Oh, um, I, I shot suppose for, for me, point. two I had two really good outcomes we had that stick in my mind. One was when we were Apache Afghanistan, and we got called in to support a troop on the ground um, who were they were pinned down by a sniper in a building, they were in a field totally in the open and they'd basically got themselves into a hollow in the field and they were heads down and it was proper old school. They, uh, I was you know, speaking to them on the radio and they said, we, well, we put our helmets on a stick and we stick them up. They're getting <laughs> shot by the sniper, <laughs> genuinely. Um, and we managed to identify the building and we engaged the building. Oh, cool. Um, destroy the building, destroy... Obviously, sniper was in there, and they did a follow-up sweep afterwards, and they found the weapon. So it was all confirmed that you know we'd engaged the right target. There was no collateral other than what we wanted to damage. Uh, but more importantly, we got the guys out, which was, you know, that was, for me that's brilliant. Um, and then the second one, we got called in the middle of the night to go and extract a team from Northern Scotland. So we were on exercise. And we had put the guys in, uh, we put them in the day before, uh, 
and then we got a call. What were you flying? So this was in the Puma. Yeah. Apologies. This was in the Puma. And we were, I was doing training with one of the frontline guys. We were doing some mountain flying techniques and we had, had a load of guys in the back. We had 10 of them and we were going to put them into another location. And we got a call over the radio, I think it was, from the, um, the, oh God, ARC, the Rescue Coordination Centre got hold of us. And this team that we dropped off the day prior, someone had fallen, suspected broken leg, and they're in northern Scotland, right in the middle of nowhere. And so we had to come up with a plan, and we got from the Lake District to northern Scotland um, after bullying various air traffickers to open and give us fuel up at Lossy Mouth. And then we got in, and this was just when Puma 2 was in. So we were using all this new kit, which was brilliant. We wouldn't have been able to do it previously. Weather was terrible. Long story short, we got in, <laughs> uh, we got the team out, um, and we managed to get them back to sort of safe location and then return. I think it was about a nine and a half hour flying epic for the day. How bad was the weather? I like how bad we talking. Uh, so Scotland, we, Scotland, Scotland weather. weather, yeah. So we had to do two. Um, we tried to do it at low level, and then we had to do two aborts. So you, the weather just gets too bad to fly visually we tried to to approach them at low level no so we were we were just trying to get to scotland trying to get to uh, the northern part of scotland and we were trying to go visually if you like so oh, okay. fly on goggles you know under the weather <coughs> oh, it's, uh, nighttime. it's nighttime now oh it God. went day into night and then uh, <laughs> so we ended up aborting into cloud in a valley up a lock uh, but we knew the heading was safe, etc., and we climbed up, and then we got over their position just using a GPS position, which, again, we had the new kit on board that we wouldn't really have been able to do before. So we got right overhead them, and there was a hole in the cloud. Oh, just no happened way. to be there, and I could see a single point of light on the edge of this loch. So we did a sort of spiral descent through the cloud, down below the cloud, and then flew up the loch under the cloud till we found them on the side of the uh, loch, and they'd put out a... They'd put out a box for us to go and land in. So we landed in that. Um, we've got, we had quite strict limits on like slope we could land on at the time. And as we were approaching it, it was one of those things, you know, you look at it and you know what it's like through MVG <laughs> yeah, stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this just doesn't look right. Anyway, we landed and they'd put this box on the side of the hill. <laughs> so the aircraft was well out of limits. So we just put the nose wheel on and then I was like, just, you know, just get them in. So we held it on the nose wheel got them in and then we had to get back and we had to climb back up through the cloud and get them into and it was about two in the morning by this stage so trying to find somewhere open to drop them off and they had weapons and yada yada oh god so yes those uh i think i suppose weirdly rescuing people is the two things that what were they doing up there weapons set um they were on exercise training up there so it was sf oh jesus christ yeah so, oh, which was which was it was cool <laughs> <laughs> kept us busy good when you were descending down why did you spiral was that just to keep eyes on because so why can't you just like adjust, so adjust adjust it so you can adju- just adjust l- height start like uh, going down like an elevator you're safer flying forward if that makes sense why is that um w- if you in a helicopter if you're in the hover <coughs> so you're not moving if you start descending too fast, um, you can get into a situation called vortex ring. So you basically, um, if you're descending vertically, you pull in power and the blades create a vortex on the end and it gets bigger and bigger and you start ingesting like your own downwash and so you start actually losing lift. So if you get into that situation, it's very difficult to recover it's quite difficult to recover from um and you will effectively drop drop out the sky so to stop that happening what you want to do if you're descending quite quickly is you want to keep moving forward so we had a hole in the cloud so if we keep moving forward and fly around the edge of the hole uh then i can then i can see as the pilot and stay visual and i didn't want to go back into cloud why doesn't the same happen with drones it does it does. If you Google, really? yeah, if you Google uh, drone vortex ring, <laughs> you'll see there's loads. I'm of, doing it. I'm d- doing get, it. Get on, and you'll see there's loads of video footage of drones uh, smashing in um, from the hover, descending vertically, and then they it gets irrecoverable, and they just keep 
And people Descending. don't. And people, I suppose, go, "Why did my drones drop at the sky?" And they go back to the manufacturer. And yeah, probably and the manufacturer doesn't know either. Doesn't know either. Um, but yeah, you have to fly out of it, and uh, the controls become really weird when mate, it's fully developed. This so. is critical information. <laughs> Simon Piles <laughs> is listening. He's got a drone. He's he's listening intently now. Going, tell me it. <laughs> well, tell me again. Tell me again. <laughs> right. So, so, Google it. Does it? So is it any rate of descent? Um, so. In a helicopter, we normally say over 500 feet per minute. And if you've got less than 30 knots airspeed as your rough safety margin. Okay. Hang on. I can do this. I can do this. Okay. Right. So the one for helicopters is um, when you're doing surveillance. Yeah. You know, like the, like the police, if they're in the hover, they have to be really careful that you don't start descending and not realising. Right. I didn't realise that. So... I didn't realise that. That's interesting. <laughs> Let's have a look for this now. Have a look. See what you can find. The drones should come with a warning. <laughs> they should. See what they... Uh... Right, so what's it called? So if you go uh, Vortex Ring. Vortex Ring. Um, if you put drones. Vortex Ring Drone. Vortex Ring State Drone. There you go. Let's have a look at this. Sorry for people listening. Oh, I'm watching. You can't see this. <laughs> so I have a clip. Oh, I was talking shit. The downward, the dreaded vortex ring state, or the downward the wobble, wobble of, of death. death. <laughs> Which is not good when you're in a helicopter. <laughs> Come on, let's get to a clip. I was going to say, there's normally uh, video footage of stuff smashing in. Yeah, it's not showing it. Anyway. This is terrible listening of you. Um, I'll have a look after. All right. Got it. Understood. So but you work a lot with drones now, right? No. <laughs> no. Take that back. No, I don't. You don't. What are you talking Sorry, about, Hugh? No, no, no. no drones, I'm afraid. Right. Uh, you training still now, though? Yes. Because so you only got out last year, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, only out last year. What's and it been like? What's, uh, what's for, what's the, when last year did you get out? Left in August. Oh, Oh my God! So not September, October. No, these are fingers. September, October, November, December, January. Five months. Five months. Been out. Five months as a civilian. Has it hit you yet? I'm not sure. I'm still waiting because everybody says to me when they get out, "There's a big." Uh, you know, I haven't had uh, a big. Is, like, you, oh God. it's only a big thing. Is it, you only get a big impact? I think if you're not able to get a job, yeah, or get income, right, to sustain yourself. And or a little bit later, like happened to me when I realised, oh my God, when you get made redundant or something like that out yeah. of the blue. Something like that. Something you become jobless. And yeah. you go, oh my God. Because that is something you take for granted when you're in. Yeah, that's true. The job, job security. security. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That Hopefully that penny drops for you today and you don't sleep a wink of sleep yeah. tonight. Brilliant. I apologise in advance. Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I think that's when it comes. Like, shit. Yeah. Shit. Well, uh, you know, what's going down? This is not the same thing. This is not, yeah, this yeah. is not what I signed up for. Doesn't sound like yeah. you're in that position. No, uh, no, I'm, <laughs> thank goodness it's all good. <laughs> Thanks, you. Uh, yeah, so I uh, I fly for the air ambulance, and that's... Oh, that's, I didn't realise that. Yeah, so I do Apparently. fly for the air ambulance, and then on the, as well, I've got, I uh, run my own company. But you, so, so you, you, sorry, you, when you leave as a pilot, yes. you have to... Go and get your flying ticket, don't you? Yes. Your license. It doesn't matter what you did military. It doesn't apply, right? No, you get you get a little bit of dispensation, if you like. In what area? So, uh, for... I'm trying, I'm trying <laughs> to think. So, things like um, to become... To get your civilian pilot's license, commercial, you need about 13 exams you have to take. Um, because you've been military, you don't have to do any, um, any official lead-up for those exams. You can just take the exams. So... It's not okay. a massive dispensation, mm. but uh, it may save you a lot of time. You get some credit, or you get credit for your flying. So again, the amount of flying you need to do to get your license is massively reduced. So I, I still need to pay to get my license, but I I can just do a little bit of training and then a test rather than the full package that if you were a civilian pilot and you wanted to do it, you'd have to do. If you're a civilian pilot, how many yeah. hours is it to get your license? Depends what level of license you need. I would, let's um, say so I'm Hugh here and I want to go get my license because I want to fly in the daytime around places sometimes. In a little just plane. For, just for, no, 
And you I want to fly be, a helicopter. You want to be in a helicopter. I want to be in a helicopter. Because why play it safe? Now you're putting me on the spot because I should know this. Oh. Um, <laughs> the ballpark. Ballpark. Uh, ballpark, you're talking about 40 hours of flying. That's it? Yeah. You're yeah. joking. I know. That's it. That can't be far off what it was. That's like only about double what you need in a car. Yeah. It's not very, it's surprisingly not very much. Most people take more to get to get done. You were uh, telling me, right, there's pilots up there in the sky and look up and they potentially have just got their license yep. and they've only done 40 hours of flight, 40 hours of flying, yep. potentially. Yeah, all going solo after about 10 hours. So, yeah, terrifying. Oh my God. Yeah. Not just the drones <laughs> dropping out of the sky, no, is it? You need learner plates on. You That's know. crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's surprisingly, surprisingly um, few hours. If you can hear uh, banging, that's DIY going on at the rugby club outside. Nice. <laughs> um, okay, 40 hours, but what about on the theory side and the examinations? You said 14 examinations. I take it as a mix of theory and flying. No, no, so that's a, that is your, I think it's 13 exams you have to do. So that's a fair fair chunk of time you know revision and then the exams themselves vary from you know maybe take you half an hour to an hour to a three hour epic um to take you through all the different skill sets that you will need as a pilot um so yeah it's quite a lot it's quite a lot of investment of your time to do it how money i expect and yeah especially if you go rotary you know as a civilian just straight away if you were going to fly helicopters it's pretty expensive tens of thousands yeah, realistically. Over what period of time? Uh, as long as you want. Oh, so it, how, it kind of, you know, depends. Most people do it over a couple of years. Uh, rather than if you were sort of doing it for fun. I guess if you're doing it for a job, a lot of people will try and get it cracked. Um, and it may take you kind of six, eight months. So I get my license after a couple of years. Yeah. Or between a year and two years. Yeah. And I want to go on now. And I am going to a helicopter because I'm going to go to park it. Yeah. So I want to go and hire a helicopter. Yes. How how do I do that? How much it cost? Uh, so you go to you go to a company and they would probably take you for a check ride. So one of their senior instructors would take you for a check ride, which you'd have to pay for, and then you. How much is that? Uh, depends entirely on what you want to hire, but let's say ballpark. Um, I don't know, five hundred pounds an hour <sighs> for something small. Do you pay for the fuel as yeah, well yeah. on top of that? Uh, yes. And then what if, so I've done my, I've passed my um, check flying yep. thing. And then how much is a, a helicopter after that to hire? So then you're, again, depends on what size you want to hire. But yeah, like I said, probably four to five hundred pounds an hour for the aircraft. An hour? Yes. And that's for a cheap one. Um, is that just the flight time? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so that's for the helicopter per hour of flying um, that you do. So... If you took it away, you would only pay for the hours you're flying, if that makes sense. So if you went away for the day, you're not paying for the day um, that you've oh, got Oh, that's it. interesting, because then it's going to... But that that is interesting. So you would... Sure, you uh, charge a premium, because they, they can't hire it out for an hour in the afternoon, for example, and make another 500 quid. Yeah, but it's not... Uh, that's not how it works. So it'd be up to the company that you're going to as to whether they'll let you have the helicopter or not. Um, depending on who you are and um, where you've checked out and where you want to take it, etc. Hmm. If that makes sense. What are you flying with the air ambulance? Which can you say which service you fly for? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I fly for Thames Valley and uh, Thames Valley Air Ambulance and Hampshire Isle of Wight. How does it work? Are you like on call with them, or do you just regularly do you just do? So I do. Uh, I do shifts. So I do roughly a four on four off shift r- uh, roster with them, <laughs> and. Uh, swap between the two bases so so one on the Isle of Wight uh, so Hampshire Isle of Wight is based down at Thruxton down by Andover oh okay yeah um, at the airfield there and Thames Valley is based at Benson so where I used to work oh that's alright isn't it so yeah so which is good yeah um, it, okay right so yeah you do uh, do the shifts there um, and you just as you said you're just on call basically so you're in the in the office on call between set hours. What's your common call out with the ambulance service? Total mixed bag. Ambulance service. Ambulance air, service. Ambulance, air, air ambulance. Air ambulance yeah. service. Sorry. It is the ambulance service, I guess. Um, yeah, totally mixed. So I always I thought there'd be 
a common theme, you know, people breaking themselves on mountain bikes or horse riding or whatever, but it's just a total mix of uh, of people injuring themselves. What was the last call you did? Uh, we went to Slough and uh, there was a two-year-old having a heart attack and I got the doctor. Two-year-old? Yeah. And we got the team there and they got them to hospital and saved them and it was all good. So you definitely have some good days. Which yeah, is, well, that's which is cool. But by a two-year-old having a heart attack. Yeah. That's, that's, that's unusual, isn't not, it? Not, uh, yeah. Goodness me. Goodness me. How would you, t- how'd you manage that with your, with Flight Beyond Sight then, time-wise? So because it's all scheduled, uh, as I say, kind of uh, four on, four off, roughly, um, and it just runs like that, so it's great. So I can apportion my time for flying and do do my due diligence, if you like, to put in my time and um, um, sort of, uh, I don't want to say, what am I trying to say, sort of learning my checks and learning all the all the stuff that I need for the company and for the flying. And then uh, when I'm not doing that, I can then apportion my time towards doing my flight beyond site and, and running my company, which is great. I find that easy in my my simple brain because I can sort of compartmentalize it, if that makes sense. No, I know what you mean. It does help, doesn't it, yes. when you can focus on things. Yeah. My missus is the same. Um, when I'm, I think I am a little bit. When you throw something in the, in the middle, that disrupts the, what you're focusing on. It really throws it, things out of kilter. But if yeah, you know what you're makes, doing. It's routine. It's yes, routine, right? It it's routine. routine. It works. I think we all like routine, don't mm. we, to, at some level. Even at an hourly, at a four-hourly mm. level, it yeah. works, doesn't it? Yeah, What's, definitely. Um, What's the intent? Well, how flight was like yours? Did you set it up when you leave? Or yeah, so I was still in, and I uh, when I came back from Canada, I set up Flight Beyond Sight. Um, oh right. So what year was that? That was in. We started looking at it in 2019 and set the company up in 2020 during the just before the pandemic. Great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was the that, and that was I'd made my decision to leave. So. I was trying to get the company in set up at least so that when I left, I would have something that I could sort of be working on, even though we're not really making much money at the moment, which is fine. Um, but it's all going the right way. So, yeah. Go on, tell me about the company. Um, so we do two strands effectively. Uh, it's all about training, uh, as that's what, you know, that's my background. Uh, so training for civilian and military um, I'm looking at at the moment. Part of it is using training pilots, training pilots, training aircrew. Okay. I'll say so. Um, <coughs> it start my sort of vision was to train pilots, but we've started looking at doing rear crew training as well. So and that's working really well. Um, and we are looking at where else we can take it. So with the rear crew, we're looking at training gunnery, and could we train airborne gunnery using um, some of our equipment? So half the company we look at uh, training using headsets I don't know if you saw them when you were up uh, with Chris we had a couple of the headsets up I there. did yeah I did yeah. I did I did see them yeah so using uh, 360 video and um, some a little bit of virtual reality to train people and then the other side is using virtual reality on a platform that we spoke about before um, to teach actual flying skills and the one thing I realized when I was starting to look at look at setting some simulation stuff up, is that your average civilian pilot, like you were talking about, doesn't have access to a simulator, which we kind of take for granted in the military because we always use simulation. Oh, really? Okay. So by by getting a low cost, uh, effective simulator, I can then take civilian pilots. Like you fly a little Robinson Forty Four, you know, a s- small little piston helicopter. Uh, and you've never before been able to maybe practice a full suite of emergencies, well, you can now uh, come to our company and we can set you up and we can run through some emergencies um, and we can run you through your procedures and we can look at things like bad weather, um, what to do as it starts to get dark, et cetera, et cetera. So we can teach and then reinforce by putting them through the virtual reality uh, training system. So that's our that's the plan. Um, I've also looking at whether we've got military applicability as well and how we could apply the virtual reality trainer for military and um, where that could fit in in the military training system if you like so 
Can we just come back a step? Yeah, sure. When you, you said piston helicopter, <laughs> what did you mean piston helicopter? So, as in small helicopter flies on a piston engine, not a Quark. jet turbine engine. So, like a normal internal combustion engine? Yes. So, like a little aeroplane engine, which is exactly what it is. Oh. All right. And Okay. Cool. That answers that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. How can... On the VR side, the VR training side for civilians, what's the advantage of doing that? Is that as, could it be used to just as a continuation training? Or could it be used to... For What would it be used for? So... Like... Why isn't he, why don't they have access to simulators now? So, until recently, I'd say the technology wasn't there. So the simulators, like the one we use in the military, a a massive crew simulator. You know, so I don't know if you've seen them, mm. but basically Never a mock up helicopter yeah. on hydraulic jacks oh. probably weighs about eight tons. Um, the whole thing moves around. It's like being in a heli- in a helicopter. Oh right, That's but you know they cost what sort of fourteen million. <laughs> quid something like that for a simulator um and they're really expensive to run so you would never get a simulator like that for a small helicopter why is it sorry why are they expensive to run um just because you've got um there's a lot of electronics computing power screens uh the old ones are hydraulics yeah yeah, Yeah, exactly um so and you need someone to run it who knows what they're doing so that was never available. So you couldn't practice your your practice stuff that you wouldn't want to do in a helicopter like your tail rotor instant um, that you were talking about earlier. Whereas now, uh, with virtual reality, <coughs> we can we've got a platform that's very representative of flying, and it's really cost effective. So we can put the guys through their paces for a much reduced cost and effectively give them a facility that they didn't have before if that makes sense yeah so your platform that you've got yeah explain it to me okay uh so we have a motion base so as we were saying about the size of this table so it's uh it's on jacks so it makes you feel it moves then so yeah it makes you feel like you're in the helicopter if you like or airplane because we can do airplanes with it as well um, it's got a full set of helicopter controls on it. So again, you're physically flying the helicopter and then we use a virtual reality headset instead of using screens um, that would have been used old school, you know, when people used to do or still do flight sims on their computers. Instead of using a flat screen, you use virtual reality. So you can look around, you can do full sort of 360 head movement. As if you're in whatever platform you want to be in. And yeah, exactly that. Is so, it our class as AR? Not VR, because you've got the motion and everything else there. So AR is augmented reality, and that's where you can <coughs> you can see through the goggles as well, so you have some kind of interaction. Oh, ah, that yes. Makes sense. yes. So you yes. could... So you could, I could look at could, that fridge over there. I could see the fridge, which is actually there in the studio now. Yeah. And with my headset on, it could put on a kettle on the fridge that wasn't there, isn't there in real life. Exactly that. Got it. Yeah. Got uh, it. Got and it. you can yes, reach through sorry. and actually touch some of it. So that's what they're looking at now for cockpits, is you'd have a, an actual cockpit mock-up so I can touch all the switches and make all the selections. But when I look out the window, it looks like we're flying, even though there's obviously nothing there. So that's mm. your AR side. Uh, VR. Who built the platform, your motion platform that you got then? So our, I was lucky enough, uh, when I was out in Canada, I worked with a company who are building motion bases for the American military. For uh, the same reason? For exactly the same reason. They use them for teaching their military. And I got chatting to the owner of the company or the owners of the company. And then when I got back to the UK, spoke to them and uh, managed to buy one of these motion bases. So we have, yeah, it's my selling point. We're using American military hardware for training civilian <laughs> pilots. <Yeah>. Hashtag American <laughs> military hardware. Sa- sounds excellent. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds fucking cool. It sounds fucking cool. Um, how, how, much move, how much motion does it give? What are we it, talking? Literally, um, we've got, it's about a one inch stroke. So, but it's enough to make you feel like you're moving when yeah. it's combined with the headset. Uh, yeah. It's also got a vibration platform on it. So the whole thing vibrates. Um, you obviously get sound as well, so yeah, it's uh, it it's very immersive. 
Um, is it an enclosed thing? Or you just sit no, on No, you you sat on it. It's got a you know, the controls and the seat, yeah. but you just sat on a base that's moving. Um and again, because you're you've got the virtual reality headset on, you don't um you just feel the movement. You don't you're obviously not seeing anything outside in the little room we've got it set up in, if you like. So Hey, you should so take that to schools. Yeah. Like I know you talk the serious application for pilot tra- or air crew training. Yeah. But imagine taking that to school or college or air cadets. I was going to say it would be. They would snap that. It would be quite cool. Bring it in the studio, yeah, mate. Yeah. Come have a, <laughs> I'll be sat come, in there. Come and have a play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, is that is that ready to roll out now? Yes. So yeah, we've I've spent about eighteen months doing uh, research and development with it. We've now got it to a state where it's working really well. We ran a course before Christmas. Um, I taught a guy who wanted to learn how to fly helicopters. Um, wanted to basically do a tester without spending a lot of money. So I did a three-day course and we taught... What, to see if he enjoyed it or something? Yeah, he just wanted to see if he... I think if he enjoyed it and if he could do it. And so I taught him on the platform. So he's taught him how to fly helicopters virtually. And he's busy at the moment, but I'm hoping he's going to come back next month to do some more that is so interesting cool. isn't it yeah like a taster let's have a look at this before i go throw my money at the actual helicopter course exactly that and it's i, th- I see it as not wasted so that when he goes across to f- fly the helicopter hopefully he'll have to do less time if that makes sense because he's already got quite a good idea of what he's doing how much time did you spend training him uh so we did three days so three days of Fucking training heck. Was... like all day for three days no we did three mornings Three more. So yeah, a bit of ground school, and then we got him in the platform and uh, and taught him and let him fly, and he he progressed really well actually. So, what was he wearing? Normal. Do you get him in the kit? Or is he like no, no, rocks no, up no, in jeans his school and t-shirt. Run <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, school run clothes and just yeah, jump in and let's go. So yeah, that's the yeah, you know, that's kind of where I see it going. Um, um, we've got uh, another course running, hopefully. At the beginning of next month, I've got someone who's interested in coming down to experience um, bad weather and flight. What do you, you know, what do you do when you encounter bad weather in in a helicopter? Um, and how should he progress? And what if he gets caught out and he flies into cloud, etc.? So we're gonna we're gonna look at running a little course for that. So on a safety side, um, and again, the simulation allows us to people in scenarios that they wouldn't be allowed to get into normally like encountering drones like encountering drones exactly so we can do that so uh and birds birds yeah so we how much of a danger are birds to helicopters in, in real, realistically um there's there's a lot of examples out there of it going badly wrong so i've we i'm sure most pilots have hit a bird or two at their time, oh, really? and normally it's fine. You know, you hit a little sparrow, whatever. It but when is it not? Where, when do they? Where do you not want? Well, obviously, the classic is you see them going into like the air duct or the air intake or something like that. There was a, I believe it was a Black Hawk or Sea Hawk variant from. That's ironic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> flying, <laughs> uh, flying from Mildenhall, I believe. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, and it was, I think they were seagulls, something, quite big birds anyway, and they took about five of them through the cockpit. Um, into the cockpit? Yeah, into the cockpit. How fast were they going? How fast were they? You know, you think if, you're, if you're doing about 100, say you're doing 120 knots. Oh, my if God. You hit a, if you hit a bird, it's coming through the windscreen. That's going to kill you as well. Yeah, well, I think it incapacitated one of them straight away, but for them, unfortunately, hit the... Um, the levers that control, I believe it was the fuel flow to the engines. So shut the engines down. Oh my God. So they went from flying, hit birds, and they were in the, I think they hit the water rather than the ground, but they were in, they crashed within about, it was less than a minute. Uh, and they went did straight they survive? In. No. Oh shit. Yeah. But that was just birds. So yeah, it could be, could be really bad for you. How would you mitigate against, mitigate against that risk? Um, so what do we do it try and avoid i guess try and avoid times so birds are you're more likely to get them at around dusk like in the in the summer they fly around dusk so at that time maybe try and put your height up a bit uh fly with your lights on 
as in they fly a distance at that time because they go so back they to seem roost, to, yeah it? exactly that. or nest so, roost. So roost nest <laughs> whatever yeah, yeah, <laughs> they yeah, seem yeah. to be more active at that time so yeah. you know maybe pick your height up at that time um what then, height what what height are they at below what, below what height are they at oh i don't know but we'd you know as military pilots you'd be low level so down at say 100 feet you're more likely to encounter them so bring your height up above 500 feet um you may still encounter them but less likely and then just a good lookout so keep your eyes out and try your best Fucking so. <laughs> mm. um what were we talking about before that oh the platform yeah the platform, platform. yeah, yeah that's, that's that sounds really interesting actually it sounds really interesting how many do you uh how, how many do you envisage having platforms wise <sighs> grow into honestly i don't know Obviously, um, you'd love thousands. Obviously. Yeah, it'd be great. The uh, I think the American Navy have just bought three hundred. So uh, from that company. From that company. So yeah, it would be uh, at the moment. I just like two. So I've got. I'm experimenting with a a non-motion based platform. See if we could fly together. So you could do formation flying, and see how that would work. Uh, could be quite cool in VR. So that's my next. Who's experiment. developing the VR side of things for you? So Is that we, in house? You do, you guys do. No, so we just use a, a commercially available. Uh, we use Xplane, which is just uh, flight sim software, if you like. Yeah. Um, it doesn't. Well, for me at the moment, it doesn't make sense to develop your own software. Obviously, that's pretty expensive. Mm. Um, so using commercially available stuff that's tried and tested is the way forward. Mm. Um, I've got some ideas, but probably you know, like everybody, I think who has their own company, you probably have ideas that you've got on the back burner, but waiting to see if you actually make any money before you start splashing out and trying to uh, invest. Yeah. And, yeah. Do, so do you, at the moment, I might, the, the cogs in my head are turning, <laughs> mate. Yeah. At the moment, someone could come and go, I'd like to experience flying a helicopter, please. Yeah. Like, I don't, I'm not asked about doing the course. Yeah. I don't want to go and get my license, but I'd like to have a bash and just see. I just want to see if I'd be mega because I'm really good when I fly helicopters on my oh, on my Xbox at home, <laughs> yeah. on my PlayStation. Can I come and have a go? And can you supply me the flight suit and the helmet? <laughs> I don't know about the flight suit and the helmet, but I can definitely <laughs> put you through your paces. Uh, you need to supply helmet. flight need, suits. That's mate. what I need. Is I'm telling you, flight customer suits. experience. Yeah. If that dude rocked up, we want to do his uh, his helicopter flight experience, and you put him instead of just putting him in the school run clothes, and he rocked could, up, and he was in a flight suit. Do you think we could and charge him more? Helmet, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> or give him a better experience. It's the customer experience, experience. Jamie, Sorry. isn't it? Yeah, Stick right. him in a flight <laughs> suit, mate. I am telling you, and it's the fox. That's true. You're looking cool. Yeah. You must have a flight suit. Yeah. I'll <laughs> just get a spare. Got flight some spare suits, old ones ticking around. You. Flight suits, that's the you way it's at. You can thank me for that one later. Yeah. Flight suits and helmets. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Plug it all in. Talk to him through a, a radio. Yeah. Be in a separate room. Yeah, all good. Mate, like, why aren't you writing this stuff experience. down? It's all up here. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up here. <laughs> thank you. Brilliant. What do you, you, you see the evolution of it being? Obviously, the military, supplying the military is aspiration. So what would the, be the advantage of the military? Is that they wouldn't need to go to the £40 million pound simulators that they've got. They, they could do it in-house. So they, it's yeah. more regular simulation training. Yeah, exactly that. So um, if you could use it at the basic level for you know, student pilots, effectively. So like you were saying, oh, I want to learn how to fly a helicopter. Well, you know, the guys in the military who want to learn to fly a helicopter, you could have one of these platforms and then they can use it whenever they want within reason um so lots of practice uh the other beauty is that because it's small and as we were talking about before the before this you know you could take them out to sites and use them so you could do you know military pilots do collective training get them out to different units but you could all be flying together because you could link them all up um, and then you could all be in the same battle space so it'd be quite it could be quite cool for uh collective military training um, that is at the moment there it's sort of aspirational but for a, uh, for an air crew side it's very difficult to do because um, most of the simulators are all made by different companies etc and they won't talk to each other or it's very difficult to get them to talk to each uh. other whereas this stuff is commercial off the shelf reasonably straightforward and as long as you've got an, a decent internet connection you're good to go so that's I think that's where I'm looking at next you could also open the conversation to Games designers could. I think they've got that 
market's sewn up, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm honest, I think they look. Oh, yeah. They probably look at my company and go, mm, "Yeah, whatever." <laughs> it's, it's, it's too realistic. Why are they all in flight suits? What's going on? <laughs> yeah. No, I I, lo- I love the sound of it, especially on that. You know, people who aren't interested or oh, haven't got the money to go and be a pilot, but just want to have a bash. Yes. It's really interesting. When I went to, oh, I can't remember where the event was. Is when I, we mentioned Blue Abyss off air yep. before when I was working for those guys. And I went to, what the hell was it? I can't remember what the event was, but Space Geeks convention. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't a Space Geeks convention. It was it was an exhibition, not an exhibition. It was a, a what you call it? A, um, yeah, ex- a, expo. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> all space stuff. Long story short, one of the... One of the big organizations, the world might have been the World Interplanetary Society, something like that. On they had a massive stand, and one of the things they had in their stand was a replica of the control suite for one of the Apollos. Um, oh wow! For for on on the uh, for docking with fucking whatever they were docking with. I, yeah. I can't. I can't I, yeah, I, I can't remember what. Yeah, uh, might have been the the moon lander docking with the the orbit in. Yeah. yeah, whatever it was, right? And you you could have a go of it, and you had to, you could have a go at the exact controls that they used. Yeah, obviously a replica. Is that the control? Yeah. Exact view that they use and try and dock, b- right. dock back up the spaceship. Yeah, and it was no, you know, it wasn't like VR. VR. <laughs> you weren't sat anything moving. <laughs> And just that alone, it was incredible. It was incredible. You, you think, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing, st- this is like, this is proper hard stuff. Yeah. Except I can't get killed if I mess this up. Yeah. And it was proper difficult. But that's why I, I saw, yeah, I've done that kind of, I haven't done the helicopter kind of thing. But that, everyone likes the simulation stuff, don't they? Yeah, I think they do. And, and, and it's not, and, the di- and you, do, you can do your Microsoft flight simulator, but it's Microsoft flight simulator state of talking to you. It's not Jamie Anderson, ex-pilot, Flipping gazillion years of service in teaching you, taking you through, through the drills, and then you're sitting in your fucking flight suit, in you know, in the um, in the simulator. I love it. I do like the sound of it. Yeah, I like the sound of it a lot. I like the sound of it a lot. We're getting positive feedback. Everyone that's been down so far is you're getting positive feedback it. from me. I've not, I was even, been say, in it not yet. even been in it. I'm impressed. <laughs> I have seen the VR though. So yep. uh, Chris had he's got yes. a headset. Yes. In his living room. <laughs> Yeah, he's got yes, or a he's smaller got, version. He's got the An headset in his. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah, because we set yeah. that up for him. So, well, yeah, I experienced that after a few whiskeys. Yeah. Right, I enjoyed okay. that. Yeah, okay. where are you based out of now then? Uh, so we're down at White Waltham Airfield. So Where's that? we're Maidenhead Slowway. Oh, so down. Okay, we're about half an hour from Heathrow, oh, just off far. the M4. Yeah, that's not far. So yeah, it's um, it's pretty good. Um, we got a unit down there. Yes, so we're based with a company called Helicopter Services who do helicopter training, real helicopter training, and we've got a unit in the hangar there. Um, and I'm I'm actually partnered with the guy who owns Helicopter Services, so he, which is excellent. Are they using you at the moment? Uh, not yet, but we're looking at how we could go ahead and hopefully use the VR to help deliver flying training for, like you were saying, you come along. You want to learn how to fly a helicopter? Cool, we can do a bit of VR. He's got another simulator that we uh, that I look after, so we can do a bit in that, and then he'll put you in the helicopter, and one of his instructors will take you and teach you in the helicopter, and then kind of a mishmash of all three. Oh. So, like you say, keep costs down, and hopefully get a better product at the end. Oh, so like that's it. what we're uh, yeah, that's what we're looking to do. Sounds good, mate. Oh, uh, what have we not talked about that you that we wanted to mention? Uh, from my side, that was it. To be honest, it, just yeah, talking about the talking about the company. So thanks for that, mate. And it's interesting. Seems, I love yeah. all that side of things, you know. And yeah, and uh, it it's, uh, it's it's nice to be able to um, learn more about the flying side of things, learn more about the helicopter side of things, and to be honest, the circle the circle of people that I've been introduced to through Chris Vosper. Yeah, you're not morons. <laughs> you're not morons. I'll, you know so. Possibly. Well done, you. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You're good people. That's nice. It's good. Um, and I'm glad to be able to help. So, mate, i got to get my ass in that simulator. Yeah. I'll come bring down. my own flight suit. I'll buy one. Come bring down. My flight suit. Bring your own flight suit. I'm going to... And we'll I'll source put you through your paces. i got to think about what my um, my, my n- name's going to be. Got yeah. What do they yeah. call that, nickname? Your call sign. 
Oh, oh my fuck, fucking what a be, moron. You'd be a moron, aren't I? Call sign. Of course it's your call sign. <laughs> <laughs> I work out what my call sign's going to be. Yeah. If I make it something like, I don't know, something different, like Maverick. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's been used. I like it. <laughs> I don't think anyone would have heard that before with you. I think you're... Uh, like it with a slogan as well. Like, some kind of... I feel a need <laughs> for speed. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, we'll Co- talk off. Yeah, we'll talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> how, do, how do people um, follow what you're doing? Web- uh, so, website, social media? Yeah, so I've uh, I've got a website and I use LinkedIn quite heavily as well. So that's really my two platforms that I'm using at the moment. LinkedIn's very spam tastic at the minute, isn't it? Have you know? Is it it's hitting you? It's not my too inbox bad mate, at the moment. It's crazy with people really? from India, Pakistan, that that part of the world hitting right. me just with just out of the blue sales pitches for random stuff. Got I yeah. don't know why. The last two months has gone crazy. It's probably because you're really popular and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I don't. I don't want the training they're offering. No, yeah. like, no. no thanks. I'm no, fine. Or they realise yeah. I'm, I'm really exploitable. Right. <laughs> like they, they sense yeah. the weakness. You're the target get this market. Guy. Yeah. Get <laughs> yeah this we can guy. get him. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I haven't experienced that. I'm sure it's to come. Oh, it's coming, mate. It's coming. I'm going to refer him on to you. Yeah. Mate, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Me. Cool. And good luck. Thanks. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I have a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.